we're going to move under to announcements and presentations. Item four. Number A, receive report and receive status of local emergency related to repairs to Crestmore Canyon and continuing declaration of local emergency. Director Tan. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council. Public Works Director Jimmy Tan, I'm here to provide a brief update. Sorry, this thing is not working. Um, sorry, the clicker is not working for some reason. But I'm um, here to provide a brief update in regards to the, uh, the Crestmore Canyon project. So since our last council meeting um, on February 25th, we've made some additional progress on the project. Um, the contractor, Hillside Drilling, continued to mitigate the tiebacks uh, that didn't meet the performance test requirements. Um, as previously mentioned at the last council meeting, four tiebacks uh, didn't meet the performance measures. Um, since then, three of those passed. It's, it's moving on the computer, but yeah. And uh, one tieback still remains. Uh, so one of the tieback had to be redrilled. So the contractor remobilized the tieback equipment on March the 3rd. Uh, drilling of the tieback number three uh, commenced uh, on March the 4th. And currently we're waiting for the test results to come back, uh, whether the tieback uh, meets the performance test. So I had some pictures to show you as well, but um, hopefully it works. But I'll be happy to answer any questions. This concludes my presentation. Any questions of the director at this time? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jimmy. I appreciate it. We'll move on to item B, uh, which obviously we've been reading a lot about, and uh, for those watching the news and seeing what's going on uh, around the world, see uh, OVID ID COVID-19 update, and we're going to give that to our city manager, Javon, please. All right. Good afternoon, members of the city council, to the mayor, uh, members uh, of the audience. As we work out the AV issues, uh, we have a PowerPoint uh, prepared for you, but uh, as we switch our PowerPoint, why don't I uh, just launch into it? Um, my name is uh, Javon Grogan, uh, and I have the pleasure of serving as the city manager for San Bruno. Uh, we find ourselves now uh, in the uh, midst of a international uh, virus outbreak uh, by the name of the coronavirus, COVID-19. 19 uh, because the outbreak uh, started uh, late in 2019. Uh, and so as we're all noticing in uh, not just the uh, local media, the, the, the state and international media, uh, this outbreak is, uh, is affecting the world. And we want today to provide you with an update, um, to the, provide an update to the general public, to provide an update on the closure of our senior center uh, and talk to you about some of the precautions that we have already taken and those that we will be taking. So our agenda uh, for tonight uh, is item one, we'll provide an update on COVID-19. All right, uh, we're back, we're good. Uh, item two, we'll talk about the temporary closure at the senior center. Item three, uh, we'll talk about some of the next steps to limit uh, exposure uh, in the city. Uh, we'll talk about the recommendation by the county health department uh, about non-essential gather gatherings. We will then talk about other next steps and then uh, answer any questions that the city council may have. Uh, and so let's begin uh, with COVID-19. Uh, COVID-19, uh, the CDC, so the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, is responding to an outbreak of respiratory illness uh, called COVID-19. The outbreak first started, as we all know, in Wuhan, China. Uh, but cases have been identified uh, all across the globe, uh, and our posture in the U.S. has shifted from one that was really based off of taking measures to prevent the virus uh, from coming here to taking measures to mitigate the virus because we know that it is here. Uh, as of today, uh, just before noon, we have some stats for you. So uh, in the U.S. in total, uh, there were 649 uh, confirmed cases, 25 deaths, uh, and jurisdictions that are reporting 
cases of COVID-19 include 36. Uh, and so uh, we sit in the San Francisco Bay Area region uh, and on the CDC website, there is a map of areas that are potentially most prone to a large scale COVID outbreak, potentially a pandemic. Uh, and we sit in one of those regions uh, because we are connected to uh, in very close proximity to uh, a number of international airports, San Francisco International Airport, Oakland International Airport, uh, San Jose International Airport, and Sacramento International Airport, all within our close proximity. So what is happening in our county? Uh, so what we know, uh, as of today, uh, there are a total of two presumptive positive cases of COVID-19 awaiting CDC approval. 10 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in the county for a total of 12 likely cases of COVID-19 in San Mateo County as of today uh, at 1 p.m. The CDC continues to advise that the general risk to the public is low. However, there are certain segments of our population that are most at risk and the, uh, the, the largest portion is our senior population. And so a number of the steps we will, we will be taking uh, will be geared towards our senior community. Um, and a number of the steps that uh, have been advisory from the health department are geared towards uh, the senior community. I, I also want to let the community know that the city of San Bruno is working closely with not only San Mateo County, uh, the health department, uh, but also all of the other cities uh, within the county. Uh, we really want to move in concert. Uh, we are very cognizant of uh, creating panic because now is not a time to panic. Now is a time to continually prepare and to take precautionary steps for both ourselves um, and our families to ensure that, that uh, we protect ourselves as much as possible. And so many of the cities over the next days will start to announce uh, additional mitigation measures because what we know to be true is that as the number of tests ramp up, the number of COVID-19 confirmed cases will increase. That does not necessarily mean that the outbreak is larger. What it may very well mean is we are becoming more aware of what is around us. And so people are very much stepping into this methodically, uh, not to create panic, uh, but all uh, under the guise of protection. Uh, and in today's statement uh, released by the county health officer, the county health officer said, I now, I, now have a, I now have enough information to confirm that community spread is occurring in our community. What community spread is, it is a confirmed case of COVID-19 that was contracted by someone that did not travel uh, to China or another country uh, that has had a COVID out, outbreak. What it means is that by um, touching, uh, someone uh, that was infected touching a surface, um, but in, it, more than likely ingesting it, it is being spread um, uh, in our community. And so we, we have to be very cognizant of that. And so as the community uh, is aware, we did undertake a temporary closure of the senior center. We are here tonight in the senior center. Um, and let me uh, pause for a moment and, and talk through what happened. So on March 5th, we became aware here in the city of San Bruno uh, that three individuals that were on the Grand Princess cruise ship from February 11th through February 21st uh, visited the senior center, uh, but also participated as a volunteer in our lunch program on two separate occasion, occasions, one on Wednesday, March 4th, and another on Wednesday, February 26th. They help to serve, uh, prepare, and serve lunch here at the Senior Center. And every given day, we serve anywhere from 100 to 150 uh, seniors here. Uh, they took the necessary precautions, and they wore rubber gloves, um, and they, they provided um, a lunch service. When we were made aware of that, uh, one of the things that was making uh, the round in the news that day uh, was the Grand Princess cruise ship was docked off the coast of San Francisco because on that very same voyage that uh, three members of our community attended from February 11th through February 21st, the first death in California connected to COVID-19 occurred and up to four in individuals from that first voyage uh, uh, had a confirmed case of COVID-19. 
we immediately contacted the county health department um, through the uh, county uh, emergency operations center that was already activated uh, for the county. They advised us to uh, undertake a temporary closure of the senior center out of an abundance of caution, uh, knowing that of the individuals that attended our senior center and participated in helping to serve and prepare the lunch, none of them were presenting symptoms of COVID-19, but we do know that our senior population uh, is among the highest risk category for COVID-19. And so upon that recommendation, we did announce a temporary closure of the senior center until today, um, March 10th. Uh, so what did we do uh, between then and now? Well, uh, as the community knows, we put out a lot of information. We put out, out a press release. There was local media coverage. Uh, but most importantly, uh, we undertook a deep cleaning uh, of the entire senior center uh, and all of the surfaces over the weekend. We, we had, a, had an outside company come in and use CDC-approved cleaners. If you go on the CDC website, there's a whole list of uh, cleaning products that are known to kill COVID-19. Uh, and really, they're, they're some of the most common household products uh, that are out there. Um, uh, but we did undertake that, that, that deep cleaning, and we did actually do a secondary cleaning of uh, the kitchen on Monday. So every, every surface, every utensil, every equipment, every door handle, every uh, pot and pan uh, was thoroughly clean and, cleaned. And we do feel extremely confident that the risk of COVID uh, transmission in the senior center uh, is probably lower given the deep cleaning that it went through uh, than what we are experiencing elsewhere in the greater community. Uh, and so we did reopen the uh, senior center today for a modified lunch program. Uh, and we are implementing uh, what is called social distancing. So those of us that are here and looking at the audience see that every chair is about six feet uh, from, um, uh, from each other, uh, really wanting to, to do everything we can to prevent uh, community spread uh, within our community. And so what are some of the other steps that the city has taken? So we have installed um, hand sanitizers in every public building. We've posted signage in all public restrooms um, about washing your hands. Uh, we have placed signs throughout all of the facilities that encourage anyone that is feeling sick to be served remotely. We, as the city, we have a whole suite of uh, ways to be served remotely, uh, whether that's on the phone, paying bills online, uh, and putting in electronic service requests. And so we, we very much want to um, uh, keep our employees safe and have a safe work environment. Uh, we put out CDC information uh, through the community, uh, to the community in English, Spanish, and Chinese. Uh, we also um, have enhanced our janitorial cleaning of all public counters, uh, door handles, and uh, 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 um, any area that is highly utilized by the public. Uh, the other thing that uh, I did as a city manager uh, is really work with our senior leadership team and put out a number of communications to our employees about uh, not only keeping themselves safe, but caring about their family. Uh, as city employees, we are disaster service workers. And so uh, there is very much the possibility that uh, the current outbreak can get worse. Uh, and as city employees, uh, we need to make sure that um, our loved ones at home can take care of their, themselves because we will likely be here caring for you and caring for this community. And so you should know your city employees are taking a number of steps, uh, both within the, the workforce but also at home to prepare because uh, it is very, it, it, it is uh, potentially likely that we could have additional measures uh, implemented uh, that will require uh, that staff are here uh, caring for the community and, and we are very much preparing for that. Uh, a number of steps that I want to highlight that have been taken by uh, others in our local community. Uh, actually, just before this meeting, um, St. Roberts announced that they uh, are closing until March 25th, and that was by order of the Archdiocese. And so um, uh, St. Roberts will be closed, uh, and so uh, those kids uh, will not be at school. One of the things I, sh I should actually pause here and say, um, through all of the conversations that we've had with the county, uh, and the CDC, uh, everyone is being extremely cautious to not step too far into the mitigation measures because once the schools close, that creates significant uh, regional disruption. And so we want to take the appropriate steps at the appropriate time, but we do not want to step too, uh, too far too fast. And so know that all of your uh, county and local leaders uh, are being extremely uh, cognizant on uh, the mitigation measures that are being put in place. Uh, 
Uh, San Bruno Park School District is open. San Mateo Union High School District CAP is still open. The Stratford School is still open. Uh, Highlands Christian School is still open. The shops at Tan Fran uh, are still open. Uh, and our major employers um, are, are still open uh, with some modifications, and it, it's worth mentioning. Uh, so we've been touching base uh, to our local employers, and um, some of the tech companies have uh, begun to recommend telecommuting and prohibiting social guests at their campuses. Uh, and one of the things we heard today I think is worth sharing. Um, one of our uh, large employers, YouTube, and the entire uh, Google footprint, uh, their entire employee footprint in the U.S. Uh, is over 100,000 employees. Uh, that is a significant uh, amount, uh, a significant portion of the workforce. As a company, they are able to telecommute more than some other employees, and they have made the decision uh, to encourage all of their employees to telecommute, not just in San Bruno, but across their entire footprint in the U.S., because they know if they can keep their employees healthy, that is more people that are not going to be at the local health departments seeking service. Uh, and they are taking that added step, not because of any risk here in the community, but because they want to make sure that because they can, uh, and their, their workforce is set up where everyone can essentially uh, do their job remotely, they're taking that added step for our benefit. And so they're going to begin ramping down their operations uh, and really recommending that all employees telecommute. telecommute. Uh, some new added measures. So uh, this is a constantly evolving uh, situation, um, and uh, we are at the point now where it is important that we take added steps to protect the community, um, and as I mentioned before, uh, especially our senior community. And so as of uh, tomorrow, we will be issuing a press release and instituting new mitigation measures specific to the city of San Bruno. So I want to take some time and step through those. So for the Senior Center, uh, the Senior Center uh, will be open uh, from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., Monday through Friday, for a modified lunch program only. Uh, that lunch program will consist of uh, to-go lunches that will be prepared in containers that uh, individuals of our senior community can eat here or take home. Uh, one of the things we know very well is that many of our seniors rely on our lunch program uh, as their primary and sometimes only meal of the day. Uh, and we want to be really cognizant uh, and continue to provide that as long as we can. Uh, but all other programs at the Senior Center uh, will be uh, largely scaled back. Those that will continue are programs like our tax preparation services that are uh, by appointment only. And so uh, those will continue to happen. Uh, the dining hall will be set up uh, for those that do want to stay and partake in the lunch program uh, in a manner that um, has people sitting um, potentially a minimum of three uh, to six feet apart. Uh, we are canceling all events uh, at the Senior Center, uh, and at this point, um, that will be through March 25th. And so, essentially for a two-week period, we are canceling all major events at the Senior Center, and we will reassess that every week. Uh, additionally, all private rentals in all city facilities will be, will be canceled, and that's all indoor city facilities will be canceled through March 25th. And again, we will uh, reassess every week, but uh, at this point we are announcing a two-week closure. Uh, all recreation programs, with the exception of after-school care programs, will be closed for March 25th. Uh, so as long as the schools are open, we're going to run our after-school programs because we know that our families rely on that uh, after-school care. So um, our library program, our library will remain open uh, during normal business hours. However, all events will be canceled. Uh, but uh, similar to the after-school program, the homework center will remain open. All of these um, measures are subject to change. We will continue to assess. Uh, the city's emergency operations center is activated. Uh, we have staff uh, that are um, constantly getting updated data from the county and the CDC and monitoring developments of COVID-19. Uh, and so we will uh, continue to move in concert uh, and take the necessary steps to protect the community. Uh, recommendations by the county health officer. I mentioned uh, part of this earlier, but uh, the health, the statement today said, I now have evidence that widespread transmission of COVID-19 is occurring in San Mateo County. Uh, and so we all need to be very cognizant of that. And the county health officer is, um, has at this point an advisory uh, notice that all non-essential gatherings be canceled per 
postponed or done remotely. Um, and the county has set up a 24-hour hot 211 hotline. So whether you're calling from a cell phone or a landline, dial 211 in the county, you will uh, be connected to the 24-hour hotline. That hotline is specifically for non-medical uh, questions. If you have a medical need, you are to contact your physician or uh, contact emergency, emergency personnel. Uh, we are uh, frequently getting the question of where can I get tested, where can I get tested. Uh, the answer to that is the CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, are still controlling all of the COVID-19 tests. Uh, and so the way you access that test is you contact uh, your physician, you will be screened and then prioritized through that system for a COVID-19 test. Uh, there are still uh, relatively a shortage on COVID-19 tests. Uh, the national media uh, uh, has reported that uh, consistently. Uh, in the U.S., we are attempting to ramp up uh, to where we are doing approximately 15,000 tests a day. As of, a few, as of last week, only 600 tests in total had been done in the U.S. And so we are very much in the process of needing to ramp up those tests on a national level. And that is why the CDC is still controlling those tests and they are not provided by the local health department um, or your local doctor. But you do need to contact your primary care physician to be prioritized uh, and go through that process. Uh, what are the recommendations? So. It seems basic, but wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands, lather for a minimum of 20 seconds. Um, a lot of our, 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 our methods to prevent COVID-19 is similar to preventing uh, the flu. Uh, I think one of the ways I've, I've heard it said best is the, the virus doesn't have hands and feet. Uh, it relies on us to get into our bodies. And so we need to uh, provide the necessary precautions. Do not touch your face with unwashed hands. Use a barrier method such as a paper towel or tissue, or do not touch commonly touched surfaces such as door handles or elevator buttons without a barrier method. Cancel or postpone all non-essential gatherings. Uh, it's important to note that that is as of today um, at 1145. Uh, there are um, um, calls between all the cities and the county every day uh, and so as we get more information, uh, we will alert the community of that. Uh, next steps, we will continue to monitor and collaborate. Um, and the city is um, in the process of uh, developing uh, for some uh, units, but uh, revising for, another, for others what we call the COOP plan, the contingency of, um, of operations plan. And so that is a plan uh, that will uh, articulate how we, if we uh, approach a severe pandemic, how we will ramp down city services. Right now we are in a uh, posture where um, some of our uh, public facing programs are, are being canceled, but we are more or less open to, to the public. Uh, our public counters are open for taking permits, answering utility questions. Um, uh, paying, uh, uh, paying city net uh, cable bills, uh, but we may get to the point where we start to close public counters. We start to uh, only have essential staff report in, and so we are uh, revising our plans uh, to call for that. And there are a number of uh, special plans for our uh, public safety personnel, our police and fire personnel to keep them safe. There have been um, added dispatch pro protocols that have been put in place to screen uh, 911 calls. So. Um, our public safety personnel know a little bit more uh, what they're walking into uh, when they arrive on the scene. If there are any uh, indications that there could be a potential COVID-19 exposure, uh, we're some, I like to call us a, a small to medium sized city. Uh, and uh, one of the things we want to be uh, really cognizant of is that we keep all of our public safety personnel uh, uh, safe so they do not have to go out on a 14 day quarantine. So that concludes the bulk of uh, my presentation here for any questions. Thank you. Any questions from council? Linda? Yeah. Um, thank you for that presentation. I just had wanted to ask, um, there was some confusion over whether San Bruno knew at the, the prior to the closure of the San Bruno Senior Center, and I know you, you mentioned this in the beginning, but if we could just get a, a very clear answer for the public um, when San Bruno found out and when it closed Absolutely. the Senior Center. Um, so the city was notified um, of the uh, potential exposure uh, on um, March 5th, uh, and we closed the center March 5th. 
Uh, we immediately contacted the health department. I was at my desk. The community services director called, and she said, I got some bad news. And so then the next phone call was to the health department. Uh, and then in between uh, um, when the senior center closed that day and when uh, bingo was beginning, uh, myself, uh, the police chief, the fire chief, uh, the mayor, and the community service director came in this room uh, and let a number of people know that we're ready to play their bingo game and sort of wanted us to say thank you for Thank you for what you said, but can we still play bingo? <laughs> but we, we, we delivered the tough news. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, everyone was uh, very appreciative um, of, of the information. And um, I think we, we took the right step. And I've heard that a lot from the community. All right, thank you. And um, as far as the confirmed cases in San Bruno, can you explain that a little bit and how, that's, how these are counted, right. if they're counted? Thank you. Absolutely. So. Uh, if I back up to go forward, uh, there are 10 confirmed cases in the county, um, two presumptive positive leading to approximately 12 cases that uh, we believe um, will be confirmed uh, of COVID-19 in the county. Uh, we have no knowledge that any of those are in San Bruno. In fact, we have not been notified that any of those are in San Bruno. Um, I, I've been asked a question of, of the three individuals uh, that attended our programs here and helped to serve lunch, uh, what is the status of that? Unfortunately, there are HIPAA laws uh, that prevent us from disclosing that uh, due to um, uh, the, the sort of uh, direct connections um, that we have here uh, with those individuals. Uh, what I can tell you is two of them were uh, never presenting symptoms of being sick. One of them was presenting symptoms of uh, a mild cold that moderated fairly quickly, and we do not have any knowledge um, of if they have been tested or what those results were. Uh, those have not been provided. But what I can tell you is that we have not been notified of a confirmed COVID-19 case in the city of San Bruno. Thanks. And just um, one more question is, um, so I know that the San Carlos School District, the Belmont School District, the Hillsborough School District, the San Mateo School District, the Foster City School District, the Burlingame School District, the Millbury School District, the South San Francisco School District, the Brisbane School District, and the Daly City School District have all come out with statements as far as how their public schools are and how to um, work alongside with what's happening and informing the public about how to prevent the coronavirus from hopefully spreading. Um, our school district has not come out with a statement. Since the city is responsible for the after school care program at our public schools, can you talk a little bit about the partnership or the communication that's going out in regards to the after school care program? Sure. So uh, guidance um, was given uh, on May 5th to the after school uh, programs. Uh, we uh, have been in communication with the San Bruno uh, Park School District. Um, I cannot comment on uh, what communications that they have or have not uh, pushed out. Um, but uh, what I what I would say to that is, um, we are in a position where everyone is doing everything they can uh, to protect this community. Um, and uh, with that information, I'll take it back. Um, I will contact uh, representatives there. Uh, and if they have not pushed out information, uh, we will uh, help them in, in pushing out any information. Uh, what we are largely doing uh, is referring people to the health department and the CDC. Uh, we, we do not have doctors uh, on staff or the, the, the capability to uh, provide up-to-date information on changes in uh, COVID-19 cases and, and health department recommendations. And so the best resource for COVID-19 issues is actually not the city of San Bruno or not the San Bruno Park School District. It is actually the health department and the CDC. Uh, and we will continue to push those in, that information out and help the school district uh, should they need it. That'd be great. Thank you. Javon, uh, uh, thank you for the, uh, the information. Um, I also want to thank staff because I know it has, uh, you know, I was over at the uh, Mer County Emergency Services facility on the 3rd, and here it is the 10th, and obviously in a week a lot can happen. Um, but I do want to thank the team for obviously uh, activating uh, the EOC on Thursday, continuing on Friday and then to Saturday. Um, I think it's important. It's always about should we have closed the center, should we have not, I think, um, to obviously do what's right and to take precautions. Those are the steps that we need to take in order to try to ensure others' safeties and, of course, our loved ones and our other communities as we travel. So um, I do want to thank the senior leadership team 
I do want to thank the staff because I know it has kind of put things, uh, you know, doing a lot of things differently and having the emergency operations center again reactivated today. But I do appreciate us uh, trying to stay ahead of this, being in constant contact with the city managers of this county, uh, in addition to Scott Morrow, who is the uh, health director for the county. So I wanted to thank you and um, I've been updating our supervisors as well, just on the senior center on, on how our community is doing. So the county is working together, uh, but I want to thank the team for uh, doing their part as well. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on to item C, receive annual report from the Community Preparedness Committee. That is being postponed. We're going to move on to item D. Invitations to participate in the 2020 census will be mailed beginning March 12th, 2020. When you fill out the census, you are telling your story. Give your story a voice, be informed, be involved, be counted. More information is available on the city website or by visiting the county website at www smccensus.org. And just as a point of information, there was a, on uh, the 28th over at South San Francisco Jefferson High School, a 2020 census activity put it on by Supervisor Canapa, District 5, that has been postponed as of today uh, in light of uh, what is uh, occurring. Um, and there are other things too, it is just not here, our, our sister city program who we're celebrating 30 years. Unfortunately, the delegation that was coming out at the end of this month will not be here as well, uh, just for safeguards. Uh, we've signed a letter tonight going over to um, Narita to extend our well wishes and uh, that we look forward to our continued uh, relationship that we have together. Going on to item E, receive update on the San Bruno Recreation and Aquatics Center project, city manager. All right, I'm, I'm back up again. Uh, again, to the uh, uh, mayor, to the council, uh, members of the public, both here um, and at home, Javon Grogan, city manager. Uh, and I now have the pleasure to give you an update uh, on a lot of work that has been done uh, on uh, bringing this community a beautiful new aquatic and recreation center. Uh, and so we provided an update um, last week uh, to the San Bruno Community Foundation uh, and we want to provide that update here uh, to the city council. Um, and so uh, as we get that uh, set up, why don't I begin by uh, providing a little um, background on uh, how we got here. And so we all know uh, this year will mark the 10 year anniversary of the uh, explosion in the Crestmore neighborhood. As a part of that um, uh, settlement agreement uh, with pg and &E, a total of $120 million was provided to the city of San Bruno. Um, $50 million went directly into rebuilding the neighborhood. And uh, I think the council and the public uh, will remember we celebrated the substantial completion of those uh, improvements uh, at Halloween of last year, uh, just before Halloween, because we wanted to open the park uh, uh, for the kids before Halloween. Um, and. So of that 120 million, 50 million went to rebuild the neighborhood. The balance of the 70 million went to a newly created organization called the San Bruno Community Foundation. Uh, the San Bruno Community Foundation uh, then took that money and divided it up into a number of pots. The largest pot uh, of 55 million was for strategic grants. Uh, the largest strategic grant has been given uh, back to the city in the amount of $50 million uh, to go towards building a new aquatic and recreation center. Uh, and so the community will uh, remember that there was a uh, about a year and a half visioning process to say, you know, what are we going to do with this um, 50 million? Are we going to build a library? Are we going to build a rec center? And the final call was, uh, let's build a new uh, recreation and aquatic center. Um, both facilities were built in, in the 50s and uh, have far reached their end of life. And so uh, a lot of work has been done to uh, bring this vision to reality and let's talk about the schedule and where we are. So our agenda for today, uh, we, we wanna first begin with project management, project schedule. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the budget and the uh, all important CEQA, uh, California Environmental Quality Act process and the planning application. So project management, uh, on the screen you have a, uh, what looks like a very complicated diagram uh, of, the pro of, of our project management. 
the main takeaway is there are a lot of hands on this project. Um, uh, nearly every, um, actually every department in the city, uh, uh, but nearly every member of the senior management team is supporting this project uh, and various people throughout the organization. And so uh, we have in the middle of what we call our internal steering committee, uh, or ISC. It is uh, headed by myself, but made up of our finance director, Keith Demartini, uh, Jennifer Dianos, who works in the city manager's office, our community services director, Joanne Magrini, who will uh, be the department head that will oversee this facility, uh, Danielle Brewer, our superintendent that runs a number of our recreation programs, our public works director, Jimmy Tan, uh, and Darcy Smith in our community and economic development department. So that is your core city leadership team that are meeting constantly uh, to keep this project uh, on track, on budget, uh, and, and moving throughout the process. Uh, we then have a number of um, boards and commission uh, that help advise on the project. One is the advisory committee uh, that is made up of two members of the city council, uh, two members of the San Bruno Community Foundation, uh, two members of the Park and Recreation Commission, and two members of the Planning Commission. And each of those four bodies actually have a role uh, in helping to manage and make decisions around this pro project. And we, uh, we go to all uh, with updates. As I mentioned, we were at the San Bruno Community Foundation last week. Uh, we will be at Parks and Recreation in April uh, and uh, plan to be back before council sometime in May uh, for a decision on the project uh, and, and planning commission. I'm blanking on that, but uh, that is probably um, sometime between April and May. Um, and then we have a project manager, Griffin Structures, a, a outside firm that we brought in early on to help advise on this project. Um, and then we have our architectural team uh, by Group 4, uh, led by a really fine uh, crew of designers that uh, build community facilities all across uh, California. So as the public will remember, there was a, a large public outreach phase in what we call the conceptual design phase. There were two rounds. There was oh, just under um, 1,800 participants. A lot of visioning uh, for this project, a lot of community engagement, really um, the community saying, here's what we want in our building. Um, uh, we uh, undertook a phase called schematic design that is now complete. Uh, and I call that going from 10,000 feet uh, to one foot. Uh, we met with a number of stakeholders, St. Uh, Andrew's Church, PG&E, Peninsula Clean Energy. Uh, we had a number of public meetings at the foundation, uh, the city council, parks and rec. Uh, planning uh, commission, uh, and then we uh, council acceptance of the uh, uh, design palette. Uh, and what's on the screen before you is our living and breathing schedule. And that dotted line that's represented in the middle uh, is, a, is a tickler that keeps moving as we make progression. And so we are in the middle of what we call phase two uh, design development and construction documents. And I call that going from uh, one foot to one inch, literally planning where every table, chair will be, where every uh, molding uh, will be. And uh, we're in the middle of the, of the time where you, you frankly have to, to take the time to get it right. Uh, and so we're having a, a number of discussions. And, and this is a very detailed schedule, but we wanted to provide you just with this high level, uh, because the last time we provided this schedule, uh, the dotted line was way over here, and we are continuing to make progress. Uh, overall timing schedule is we hope to, uh, we're, at about, we're, at, we're at what's called the 90% uh, design drawing level, um, and we hope to uh, go out to bid in uh, June, July of this year uh, with the um, goal of bidding the project around September uh, and breaking ground uh, early next year once we select a contractor and go through, uh, and go through the um, the process of vetting and entering, entering into contract uh, in the uh, fall and, and, and winter of this year. And so we are also planning uh, a, a temporary move of our rec programs that we will talk about shortly. So this is just a highlight of, of where we are on the schedule. Uh, but again, we're at that 90% level uh, in marching through the CEQA uh, and construction uh, document process. Uh, so work in progress, a uh, number of uh, weekly meetings with our internal steering committee. There's so many hands on this project uh, that uh, it just keep, keeps them moving. And, and one of the projects that I love because there's so many people touching it and, uh, and tracking it that um, uh, I'm just so excited about the progress that, that we're making. Uh, we have technical review committee uh, meetings 
at a high level what these are is uh, literally every department, our, our fire department, uh, police department, park and rec, building maintenance, uh, extremely, extremely detailed meetings talking about every piece of HVAC or molding that uh, will, will be used and uh, what the indoor kitchen, uh, what the indoor pool will be in the nanatorium. Uh, just extremely detailed meetings going through um, everything just to make sure we get it right. Uh, we have what we call an integrated design workshop meeting where we uh, bring in all of the consultants and designers on the project uh, here to San Bruno uh, to meet with our staff and meet with our project managers uh, to uh, have face-to-face -face meetings to make sure that um, everything is buttoned up. And, and though we've had uh, three of those and, and they've all gone very well, but it's a it's a significant undertaking, uh, but extremely worthwhile uh, to do that. And then we have our quarterly advisory committee meetings where we meet with uh, the members of, the, the, of that representative body that we talked about to keep uh, you guys up to date. All right, so let's talk about the budget. Uh, budget, budget, budget. So building in this environment is extremely challenging, uh, as we all know. Uh, we are looking at roughly an all-in cost of about $1,000 a square foot once we uh, calculate uh, all of the contingencies that we have in place. Uh, it is an extremely challenging market. Uh, and one of the things that we had to uh, unfortunately um, come to grips with uh, earlier, earlier in 2019 is to build the facility that this community envisioned as more than a $50 million building. In fact, to build the base building is a $60 million building. Uh, and uh, one of the things the city council and the public uh, may remember is that in 2019, when we were in our schematic design phase, um, we had a couple things that we really wanted uh, to be included, uh, but were left on the cut on the um, editing room floor. And and one of those was a community center. There was an extreme desire for a community for center, uh, a community room, a room where you can have large scale birthdays and banquets and and things of that nature. Uh, but the in trying to make the $50 million budget, that really uh, couldn't be done. Uh, we also wanted to enhance the lobby and have an elevated walking track. Uh, and what we heard uh, loud and clear from the city council and our advisory body is um, uh, those are extremely important uh, components of the building and we need to find a way to include them. And so uh, we have a uh, current project budget is $60 million for the base building. Uh, that includes uh, all the components um, of a recreation center, a aquatic center, um, and a fitness center. Um, and as well as a expanded lobby, lounge, uh, a community hall, uh, money for contingencies and escalation, and then the outdoor pool, which is a phase two uh, of $3.4 million for construction. And so um, we have constantly done a number of things, uh, and we'll talk about some of them as we look at the site design uh, to shave cost on the budget. Uh, one of the ones, um, that our public works, I, I love to give our public works director credit for, is that uh, we're gonna be building a building um, in, a, in, a, in about a year from now. Uh, and as you do things uh, where you hire subcontractors, you pay the subcontractor and then the general contractor on top of that. And, and one of the things we noticed early on is that we could save some money if we pulled things out of the project budget and did them sooner. And so our public works director, for example, was able to um, identify additional parking and paving that needed to be done uh, to create more parking spaces near Tom Lar Field. And so we were able to carve that out of the budget and actually do it uh, cheaper sooner. Uh, and so that project is currently under design and, and will advance the, uh, the, the larger project uh, to provide some additional parking spaces uh, that will be helpful to the building. Uh, and we, we, we made a number of strategic decisions on uh, uh, what components of site improvements. There are a number of improvements that were envisioned by the community uh, for the, the greater park as a, as a part of this project. Uh, some of them we were able to uh, capture in the budget and some of them we weren't and we'll step through them. But the base building we're looking at about $60 million uh, and the city staff uh, is currently working on a plan to fund that. Uh, I am confident with uh, the uh, level of development activity that we have going on uh, and some of our um, uh, uh, payments that uh, have already been made or are expected that we'll be able to make the, the base budget. Uh, and we're gonna look at phase two or the outdoor pool as an alternate once we get the bids. We will see if we can construct that uh, uh, at, at the same time or if that is done later. We are also in conversations with the county uh, for some potential um, uh, support um, the community may be aware that uh, there have been a lot of uh, recent reports of the county 
providing uh, loan funds or other funds to help out other communities build uh, community centers, and we want to tap those resources as well. Uh, and so just a, the next slide talks about our building program. So our existing interior space is about uh, a little over 30,700 square feet. When you add our outdoor pool, that jumps that up uh, to about 41,000 square feet. Uh, we are building a bigger building, uh, so 47,000 square feet uh, with a gymnasium, a fitness and cardio uh, studio, a group X room for, for classes, uh, three individual classrooms, uh, staff offices, um, indoor pool, an expanded lobby, the community lounge, and then the outdoor pool. Uh, now, let me talk a little bit about uh, work in progress. So we are in the middle of uh, the CEQA process, and so even though we are the city, uh, we have to follow um, every rule and law just like we were a private outfit. Uh, and so uh, we are in the middle of uh, our, the environmental impact report. Uh, the draft of the EIR was published on January 27th. Uh, we had to do a biological resources uh, review, an arborist report, cultural resources uh, and Native American heritage notifications, historical resource evaluation, a hazardous materials report, traffic study geotechnical. Uh, we have pending issues uh, with regard to the uh, creek re relocation and permitting, and we'll, we'll go over that site uh, program, and I think the community knows uh, why that is so important to uh, have a protected channel for that creek. And then the planning application, um, uh, is in, and uh, we are planning architectural review and planning commission meetings uh, for the spring of 2020. And so now uh, let me give a quick highlight on the design, the overall design, and then I will sit down and turn it over to Joanne McGreeny. Uh, and so site improvements. Uh, wow. So this is the uh, building, and uh, uh, one of the things I want to point out is uh, the original, the current pool is here. And so in the original plan, uh, the idea was to take the recreation building and the pool and put it uh, into one building and sort of push it up uh, against the back of the park to create uh, this beautiful open space uh, that the community can enjoy for um, outdoor festivals and parks. Uh, and so uh, that, that is the plan. Uh, the um, uh, plan also includes a, a realignment of City Park Way. And let me go to the next slide because we have those highlighted. And so uh, there's a realignment of City Park Way, uh, widening of City Park Way. There's a realignment of, of parking. So to put all of the parking that is currently adjacent to the building and on the opposite side of City Park Way next to the creek, actually push that um, uh, closer to the building and provide a realigned and protected creek. Uh, many in the community uh, uh, know that it's sort of hard to step out of your car uh, during the rainy season in those um, parking stalls that are on the uh, southern side of City Park Way. And so we, we, we want to take that uh, potential issue away uh, and uh, have a protected creek and, and realign the parking. We'll, we will be moving the current memorial uh, to right near where the tennis courts are. And what's not shown in this image is the um, a rotary pavilion that is currently approximately here, but uh, will be uh, enlarged and expanded. And uh, the San Bruno Rotary um, uh, has committed to uh, re rebuild a, a new rotary and expanded pavilion. Um, and so with that, uh, I will turn it over to uh, Joanne McGreeny, the Community Services Director, to talk about the site design. Good evening. So I'm going to take you through some of the um, pretty pictures and fun stuff. Um, so this is a depiction of phase one, including the base bid. So the base bid is everything except for the outdoor pool. Um, and this is a cross section of the building um, showing um, the elevations uh, and the entrance. And then um, this is what the uh, aerial view will look like right over where the outdoor pool would be proposed. So what you're looking at at the bottom um, is the uh, entry area into the building that has some seating, um, a stair element, um, and then you can see the cross section um, of the roof lines and such um, for the new building. 
And so these are, again, just some photos of, um, or depictions of the exterior renderings. This would be um, you coming in from um, City Park Way. Um, the parking lot would be to your right before you uh, hit the building. And as you can see, the windows on the corner there are for the community hall. Um, if you can see, there's a small balcony off the community hall as well. Um, so there's a lot of glazing um, with the facade of the building. Um, and then if you move on to, uh, this is a depiction of the entry plaza. Um, so where you see the flags there, right um, to the left of that is the um, entrance to the facility um, with a proposed metal trellis. Um, and again, more glazing um, that you can see off the side to the left of the community hall um, would be the lobby area. And then um, the window glazing on the top floor to the left of the entry trellis is the group exercise room. So there's a lot of opportunities for people to see into the park, um, which is important as well. Um, and this is the exterior rendering of the um, uh, grass area if, um, again, phase one is all we do. Um, you can see the glazing of the indoor pool. Um, and this will serve as um, a great area for, again, concerts in the park and activities, even though if the pool does go there, we'll still be able, it'll still be a large grass area off to the side. But um, again, uh, this would be looking into the um, indoor natatorium. So um, I, I wanna walk you through, um, this is the floor plan um, of the first floor. And so I just wanna highlight a couple of things and then I have some photo uh, renderings um, of certain areas that I'll go into a little bit more detail on. Um, but as you can see, as you enter the lobby lounge, off to the right side of the facility is, um, are the classroom areas. Um, so the design of the new facility designates multiple community classrooms. Um, there are two medium-sized classrooms that can be expanded into one larger meeting room. Um, community programs that will be scheduled in these areas include enrichment classes like art, music, and dance classes, as well as lifelong learning programs like CPR, AED certification courses, and will be also used for smaller group events and parties. All of these classrooms will be used for our very popular summer, winter, and spring children's camps and provide much needed breakout spaces for different activities and programs. Um, and I'll, I'll speak more about the gym and the indoor pool and the locker rooms in slides to come. I'm just gonna move on the second floor plan. Um, again, the areas that I wanna highlight here are um, the cardio and weight area. Um, so the cardio, in the upper level of the facility, there will be a designated cardiovascular area with many types of fitness equipment, including stationary bikes, elliptical machines, step mills, and treadmills. And there will also be an area for free weights and other weightlifting machines and apparatus to accommodate all fitness levels. Um, and this fitness fo focused area of the facility is essential for the revenue generating potential. Um, and then you can see the group exercise area. It's a mirrored room with specialized flooring that will accommodate um, various types of fitness classes, including Zumba, Pilates, yoga, TRX, kickboxing, boot camp style workouts. Um, dance classes can also utilize this space and when it's not being programmed, it will serve as an additional stretching and cool down space for patrons. And then the other um, area that I wanna talk about is the elevated walking track. The indoor track allows for climate controlled workout. Um, whether you use the track to run or walk, it allows for you to go at your own pace on a surface that is usually more gentle on your joints. Um, the track will overlook the open gymnasium, which will provide views of other recreational activities taking place. So this is an interior rendering of the main lobby and community lounge. So this area will serve as a reception area for access to the pay side of the facility, program registration desk for picnic rentals, after school programs, camp registrations, et cetera, will happen here. It will also provide a lobby space off the community access side of the facility. This space will have restrooms to allow for park users to use as a location to rest, charge their devices, enjoy a beverage or a snack, and will be a great informal gathering place for the community. Um, the lounge space will also serve as a registration and check-in area for camps and larger community events. So the gym will provide a high school regulation basketball court with two minor basketball courts that will be divisible by a drop curtain. The drop curtain is actually an essential feature to this program area. It provides a divisible space allowing for multiple activities to occur at the same time. 
Activities such as basketball, volleyball, indoor soccer, pickleball can all be scheduled without balls crossing over into each other's play areas. This will allow for additional rentals, programs, kids camps, and drop-in um, basketball opportunities, and can also serve as an additional functional fitness area for boot camp and TRX type um, fitness classes. This multi-purpose space can also be utilized for large events such as teen dances, Goblin Grotto, and conferences, and it will also be, the, the facility will also be designated as an emergency resource center. The community hall is, des uh, is designed to be on the second floor of the new building to allow for scenic views of the park. It'll allow, I'm sorry, it will be a community gathering place accommodating large events like our annual father-daughter dance and the holiday boutique. This community hall would also be a popular rental site for large parties, conferences, and other events. A small catering kitchen is included in the design to accommodate for food service that is a very popular amenity for these types of rentals. So, this is a rendering, um, if you're walking down the hallway toward the natatorium um, on the first floor, um, the staircase will lead you to the second floor to the fitness area, but th there's a lot of glazing that'll allow people to look right into the indoor natatorium. There will also be a seasonal entrance off this lobby to allow for camps or swim meets um, access so they don't have to come through the main entrance. Um, where the people are on the right-hand side of this um, rendering is the hallway that leads to the locker rooms. The, the locker rooms are strategically situated between the pool and the gymnasium, providing central access to the main areas of the facility. We'll have lockers of various sizes with shower facilities that are essential amenity to attract patrons. Um, and um, again, the shower facilities are an essential component um, when you know, designating an emergency resource center. The indoor pool will be comprised of six lap lanes with a large stair area for access um, and will also have a large area for lessons, a designated spot for lessons for younger age swimmers. Adjacent to the stair area, there will be both spectator seating as well as party room space. The party room will be divisible into two spaces so it can be rented by two smaller parties or one larger party. Um, it can also be used for lifeguard in-service trainings and staff meetings when it's not being rented. The indoor pool will accommodate multiple types of programs for community partic participation, including lap swimming, water aerobics, swim lessons, and both kids and master swim teams. The pool is being designed to allow for hosting swim competitions with removable, removable starting blocks and a scoreboard. And there will also be a viewing area from the upper level into the natatorium, allowing for different vantage points when uh, um, viewing, observing aquatic programs and activities. This is a depiction of the cross section, including the outdoor pool and the splash pad. Um, and so the outdoor pool would operate seasonally during the summer months. Um, programming for the outdoor pool and zero entry children's pool with splash pad area um, with spray features and other water features would include um, community open recreational swim, would absorb the high use of lessons over the summer months, and would accommodate the extremely popular summer swim camps. Special events such as movie night at the pool could be hosted in this area, and the outdoor pool would also allow for overflow and program relocation when we're hosting meets. So the last couple slides, um, I'm gonna wrap up um, about the communication plan, business plan, and temporary facilities. So as some of you may know, um, we've already been featured um, or featured the uh, Reckon Aquatic Center in the city manager newsletters and um, additional updates will be forthcoming. Um, we're working on updating um, both the community services and community development um, websites for the project. Uh, we have uh, large boards that we put out at community events. We're working on getting the renderings updated to put those out at things like the Easter egg hunt or Operation Clean Sweep and those types of events to inform the community of where we're at and show the pretty pictures. Um, and then other mediums such as social media as ground breaks and throughout construction, um, we will utilize our email blasts um, for people that register for our programs through Civic Rec, which is our recreational software um, for programming at the Recreation Center. Uh, moving on to the business plan, um, the objective behind the business plan is to analyze expenses and revenues associated with the operation of the facility. Some of the things we will be looking at is having optimal staffing levels, what building maintenance issues may come up, and additional programming needs, how we will you know, be able to um, utilize 
both pools as rentals, um, which is not something we currently do um, with the seasonal pool that we operate. We kind of have to examine it on an annual basis, which we only operate during the summer currently. So it's examining all those different things that we don't currently um, do. And then finally, um, we are working with San Mateo Union High School District uh, to get a lease agreement to use the former Crestmore High School um, as a satellite, satellite center. Um, we think that, um, that this is the best um, option that we have considering it has two gymnasiums um, and a lot of our programming happens in gymnasiums. So in order to provide um, optimal space for camps and programs, um, this is the best um, option. Um, so we believe that if we do secure this as our temporary facility, the mo most of our recreational and camp activities will be likely accommodated. Um, the only thing, even though they have a pool, has no water in it, um, the aquatic operations will likely cease at the end of this year and will not resume into the, until the new facility opens. Um, and our anticipated move would be December of 2020 um, with potential groundbreaking in January of 2021. So that is all for our presentation and I'm sure that uh, the city manager and I are happy to take any questions. Thank you. Questions uh, from council? No one? Uh, Marty? <clears throat> Thank you. It's been a while since we, uh, for those of us that are not on the uh, subcommittee to hear what's, uh, what's happening, it seems like a lot is um, on its way. First question, the swimming pool, the existing pool was scheduled. Is the plan for that to stay operational until a certain point? And when does that go away? We're examining the utilities currently, and we believe that at the time of demolition, it will prohibit us from keeping the, uh, the outdoor pool open once construction begins. So once demolition begins, we will not be having um, pool operations. So the end of Septem or September of this year. So this would, this would be the last season of swimming? Correct. Not uh, forever. No, no. Well, <laughs> and what's the schedule on, uh, what's the estimated construction schedule if it were to break ground? 24, at, 24 to 26 months. So if we um, break ground January in 2021, 2022. Uh, we, we hope to uh, complete in 2023. 2023. Um, how, this is a business plan uh, question, so just curious what the fees would be for San Bruno residents and non-residents to, is it, you're basing it on a, a monthly rate, a yearly rate, a daily rate, just a, a range, just so right. people can start thinking of what that would cost. Yeah, so we do not have fees that we're ready uh, to put out to the community, uh, but um, like a number of our recreation uh, programs now, the, uh, some of them will, will be fee-based. Our aquatic programs now are fee-based. Uh, and so uh, we always try to stay, uh, one, uh, within uh, rel relative to the market of, of other uh, recreation programs, but also relative to our cost, uh, and absolutely cognizant of both res having a resident fee that is lower than a non-resident fee. But we are not at the point where we're ready to um, talk about specific fees. Okay. That's it for now. Laura? Yes. Has there been any communication to the groups that currently rent out the gymnasium facility and other facilities to sort of plan for the coming season of 2021, like, hey, if you're using the gym for this or using the classroom for this, that you should start planning for other alternatives? Sure. So there have been a number of broad-based uh, communications to a number of groups. Uh, the biggest communication we did uh, last year uh, was to uh, the um, summer camp. So at the end of summer camp, parents were wondering, what about summer camp in 2020? And we were able to say, absolutely, we are still planning for um, summer camp in, in, in 2020. Uh, but it's the 2021 year where we will have a relocation. We have not yet started to ramp up communication to all of our discrete users, primarily because we are working on finalizing our temporary relocation plan at Crestmore High School. And then we'll know specifically uh, how many of our programs we're able to relocate and how many of our programs are we able uh, to cease operations for. 
And do you, is your potential that that could include the use of the, the gymnasium? I, I don't know if Crestmore is currently renting it out to other subleases. I know that um, Chapel of the Highlands, there was always some competition between them using the facility and St. Robert's and other groups. So is there potential that, you know, residents or groups go through the city to sort of rent out that facility? Because it was quite costly. The, the San Mateo Union High School District came up with their hourly rate and then you got to have a custodian, you're paying for the custodian, and it really became, I mean, you can't even compare the cost between the city uh, rental fees and the school district. So that's one of the main things on our terms, um, the, the lease terms that we want to communicate about. Um, I think St. Dunstan's is also a, a school that utilizes their gymnasium. So we are, you know, that is a very important aspect of what we do. We, we rent our gym and then we use it for many different programs, elementary sports, um, senior sports. Um, so we are very concerned about making sure that we get some kind of priority uh, use or some kind of um, scheduling use where we're all working together to make the, the schedules work for everyone. They seem to have enough gym space up there to accommodate multiple groups. So we're cautiously hopeful that we can all be accommodated. Thank you. Um, another question, I guess, relation to uh, cost. So we're, we're continuing to see that number grow. Um, and even in the slide that you indicated sort of the, the, the phased or the second the option for with the outdoor pool, and that's only construction costs. So I, I don't even know what that number is going to be in the end when we finally get there. So how does that affect, um, because one of the things we really kind of didn't talk about is being able to offer a membership to the facility, right? And so my gym membership at, at you know, Club Bay Hill includes just the, the weights and some classes, but that we're able to offer sort of this full service, uh, which is very unique in any of the gyms that are in the area, where you have a pool, you have the weight room, you've got the walking track, you've got the cardio. So how does not having an outdoor pool sort of affect that pro program? And really, does it affect the revenues? Or can you still sustain that program with just the indoor pool? So the majority of what pool programming we do right now in the summer is lesson-based, camp-based, open recreational space-based. And so to have that pool, the outdoor pool, available on a seasonal basis will allow us to operate as normal in the indoor pool. Because if we don't have the outdoor pool, the indoor pool will ultimately be impacted. So you'll be closing lanes, you'll be telling people that they can't come for their swims, um, their recreational swims, which they're buying their potential memberships for. So we don't wanna displace the people that are regulars that are coming on a routine basis or our master swim team. So having that outdoor seasonal pool is actually super important. That's what I wanna hear, thank you so much. Linda? Thank you. A couple of questions. Um, I do agree the outdoor pool is very important. I attended a water aerobics class and they take water aerobics very seriously here. Um, but it was really cold, so I didn't go back. Um, my question is uh, in regards to just kind of future planning, this is really very exciting. Um, and I mentioned this before as a planning commissioner, but would there, would it be possible just really planning long term um, to see if we could somehow connect an adjacent path um, that goes through San Bruno Park to the senior center? Um, because we're planning right now anyway, I understand it wouldn't be part of this budget, but as we plan, um, I, I just remember we've had the public come and say it would be great to be able to walk here from Caltrain and there's not really a path to come to this public meeting. Absolutely, that is a needed improvement uh, in our in the park. Um, unfortunately, there were things that, uh, when we looked at the budget, and at, it, when you're building at a thousand dollars a square foot, we had to make some tough decisions on what is truly related to the building and what unfortunately has to remain on our wish list for improvements to the park. And I, I, I totally agree that that is an absolute need. That is not a part of of, of this. Um, there are components that are designed in here that um, are not sort of directly connected to the building. The best example of that is again uh, the per creek and having a protected creek. We thought that that was a needed safety improvement that um, frankly we had to make some tough choices on what was going to be in the building to make sure we had enough money for that. Um, but there are other things. Um, 
like that path from improving the path from the building to the senior center that that's not a part of this and and we still need to work on finding ways to do okay, that'd be great thanks um for the outdoor pool i know one of the questions that had come up in the past was would it be big enough to host events like polo tournaments um i just want to have an official answer from staff yes um, <laughs> It's a 25-yard pool with six lanes, so we will be able to host swim meets. Um, and I believe it is big enough to accommodate high school regulation water polo. Great, thank you. Excuse me. I think you have to speak and the depth of both pools are four feet to seven feet. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is around the emergency generator. It's um, the alternate option, and I'm just wondering, is there gonna already be a generator and this is a backup to the generator, or why is that an alternative as opposed to part of the uh, actual design and budget? Right, um, so the facility is being designed uh, to be utilized um, as a facility uh, in a disaster uh, that can be um, um, stood up as uh, a shelter or as just a community resource center. Um, one of the uh, challenges uh, w with, frankly, the budget was including uh, complete backup power for, for everything. Uh, we initially looked at uh, photovoltaics, uh, solar panels, uh, and uh, wanting to move away uh, from a diesel generator uh, and potentially looked at some of the uh, higher level uh, technologies that unfortunately come with a higher level price. Um, and so uh, what is being scoped is a diesel backup generator. Um, all of the components for uh, connecting that diesel generator are being planned in phase one. Uh, unfortunately, there's not uh, the uh, money in the budget in phase one uh, for the actual generator. That is a part of the ad alternative in phase two. Uh, we will certainly look at that, at securing that, and we've talked to a number of different uh, um, um, potentially uh, places for grants, for backup power, for community uh, centers and, and community care facilities, and so that uh, if we are successful, that could potentially be spun off. Uh, but we absolutely want the uh, facility to have a backup generator capable of powering probably everything but the pool. Okay, thank you. And the next one is just a, a suggestion that hopefully our city attorney would be able to work on, but um, to ensure that the contractors, once the RFP is out, um, to ensure that they meet their requirements to actually place a penalty fee for every day that they're over their deadline. Um, it's been pretty common when bridges have collapsed and they've needed to be rebuilt right away, so within whatever the legal purviews are, but I think that would be appropriate here. So the, the city standard uh, contracts do include those kinds of liquidated damages and penalty provisions. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Um, my next question is around green building. So is this going to be a green building? Green being very broad? Silver. Um, so I think the direct answer is uh, we are making the building as energy efficient uh, as possible. We've had a number of uh, conversations with PG&E and PCE to do that. Uh, the uh, honest answer is when you are uh, heating a pool, an indoor pool and potentially an outdoor pool, you need a lot of photovoltaics uh, and green roofs um, uh, to make it a, uh, a, um, uh, even a silver uh, uh, LEED certified building. Uh, and so uh, we are, um, I don't have those calculations for you now, uh, but uh, we are not uh, striving for a specific LEED certification. Uh, we are striving to build a building that is energy efficient, uh, but uh, has the components of a uh, indoor natatorium, uh, a, a large capacity gym, uh, and a high volume um, um, uh, two-story building. Uh, and. Uh, I do not think that we will be able to strive for LEED certification within the budget that we have. Thank you. Um, and then regarding the, just as I'm seeing the, the designs, um, as the building is being built and the, the, the rooftop is being completed, would it be possible to leave the rooftop available for a rooftop garden or a bistro that could be rented out to bring in revenue um, to the city or that the city could run um, 
as just kind of another amenity for guests and for the city to generate revenue. Right. So the roof is actually sloped and at a pitch, and, and I forget, is it, is it northwest or? Uh, it, it's whatever you need for appropriate uh, solar generation. And so the roof uh, in phase one is actually being um, um, prepped and designed for photovoltaic panels. Uh, that is approximately a, a $2 million cost for the panels that are not currently included in the base budget. Um, but at this point, we are not designing the ability to have a cafe or uh, an additional um, um, uh, use on the roof. The roof is being designed uh, for the future addition of photovoltaics. Of the sorry. solar panels. The solar panels. Okay. okay. That, that's all for me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you both for the report. Appreciate it. We're going to move on to. Oh, for Mr. Oh, Mayor. I'm sorry, Marty. I'm sorry. I. Oh, I, I didn't skip you. Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. You just have one more question. Yeah, please. Um. Parking. So about a year ago, we kind of had the update and there was a bunch of options we were looking at and it's great that we're looking at one of the additional parking areas being at Laura Field. But we, we had heard that there were some discussions about the existing parking lot on the south side of the city park and there were, could have been some potential to expand that parking area into that field that currently has a storage container on it. Um, where are we with the parking needs and, and how close are we to meeting those? Right. So we are meeting the parking generation count for the building. Uh, specifically, uh, that desire arose from the need for just additional parking um, for uh, city for city park, uh, large uh, community events. I, I think everybody knows you, uh, more parking would be beneficial, and th that was one of the components that we again would have liked to include, um, uh, potentially even working with St. Andrew's Church uh, in their parking lot and, and looking at some potential reconfiguration of that lot and looking at there's a uh, grass strip there that you could potentially asphalt in and create another role of parking. Uh, those conversations were very fruitful. Uh, uh, we did learn of a potential expansion of the St. Andrews preschool program uh, in alignment with uh, the significant need for preschools here in our region. Uh, and so that conversation paused a little bit there. Uh, but I do think that there is the ability for added parking uh, to benefit uh, both St. Andrews and, and the park. Uh, the challenge on really furthering those conversations was money. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Malcolm, thank you for your patience. Please. No worries. I, I think uh, for this topic, um, you're the only speaker, and I know it's okay. important to you, so Please we understand. Please don't count. This is my three minutes. I work the voter center. I'm a voter center lead, and we provide a lot of wipes at the voter center, both disinfectant and other types, so I'd recommend you getting those. My name is Malcolm Robinson. I first moved to San Bruno in January of 1986. Lived in Shelter Creek for seven years. Great pools, by the way. A lot of activities were around the pool. Um, thank you for the presentation. It's very inclusive and detailed. Um, I have concerns, and, I, and I'm very hopeful at the same time. I'll start with the concerns. Um, of all the people involved in talking about this and planning and meeting, I didn't see users of the facility. Nowhere. I didn't see swimmers that you brought in to talk about that. Did you talk with the lifeguards? Because the lifeguards are kind of jockish and they play water pool, um, water polo. By the way, it's not deep enough for water polo. I roomed for a semester with David Brain, all American water polo player, and it's not deep enough. <clears throat> when I go to the pool, this one, it says 10 feet, but I think it's really nine. Um, I've migrated over to Oceana Pool, which is 12 feet deep. And I start my water aerobics by diving 12 feet deep in the water and swimming five lanes underwater to where I work out. Ask anybody over there, they'll tell you that. And it, to dive in the 12 feet of water, you gotta really wanna touch the bottom. It's hard to do. There's a one meter and a three meter pool, diving board there. When I was eight years old, we moved out of Chicago to Carpentersville, I had a pool just like this one. And one of the first things they made us do was jump off that three meter 
um, diving board. And I can tell you, I was terrified. I required some coaxing to get off, and then water got in my nose. It was terrible. But I learned from that. I learned how to handle my body in water. I love diving in water, especially when a cool pool. It's the best way to acclimate right away. Um, and it gets you into the water, and it's, it's body control, it's breathing control, it's exercising your heart. So yes, I do water aerobics. Um, and I love the class. You're only open two months of the year, so I didn't see anything about what are you gonna do for a pool opening. Two months of the year, this outdoor pool is open during the day. It's open three months in evening classes. I go about 10 times a week. I drop my wife off at BART in the morning, I catch the morning class and I catch the evening class with her. So uh, I know all the people there. Um, the pool that we have could use some management. I'm sorry to see it go, um, especially during the construction. You probably need it for a work area uh, for equipment it's, and building supplies. Um, I'm hopeful. Uh, one last concern. I'm more Bauhaus as far as athletic facilities. Uh, form follows function. I'd rather see you know, a metal frame pool like Oceana um, than something that's really nice and risky. I know you're, you're making it more of a recreation center, meeting rooms and all that stuff, and that's good for the community, so I applaud you for that effort. I'm hopeful because it's gonna be a great addition to the city, and I think you ought to consider club memberships, and I wouldn't be concerned about the classes. The YMCA in San Mateo, which I was a member of for 10 years, is very good about scheduling different things. Um, so I'm hopeful that you'll put in a diving board and you know let kids learn how to handle their bodies in water. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. Is there anybody else who wanted to speak? Oh. I put in a, a card for a different thing, but I thought of a comment. Um, no problem. Hi, uh, I'm, I'm Plymouth Ansbergs. I, I live in the Bel Air neighborhood. Um, I went to a public comment session about this project, I don't even remember how long ago, um, and the one comment that I put in at that was that I really think that we need to have a consideration in this plan for gender neutral uh, locker rooms as an increasing number of our youth are identified as transgender and gender nonconforming. And I didn't see in this update, uh, they just mentioned that locker, room, locker rooms existed, so I was wondering, whether that had been considered, if it was part of the plan, and if it's too late to put that in if it isn't. Thank you. As Joanne comes up, uh, is there other other speakers? Okay. You want to speak first, and then come on. Let's get the speakers so we get all the questions at once. Yeah. That's as, okay. As I, Please. Uh, R. S. Harmon from Bel Air, and I'm actually on the uh, on the advisory committee out of the planning commission. Um, uh, in regard to the, the generator, I think as uh, if you monitor as, as renewable power prices continue to come down, I think by the time this goes into service, um, I mean, I think we don't necessarily need to commit to a diesel generator right now. I, I think you may find that especially if you consider adding um, solar shade structures for the parking, potentially solar shade structure for some picnic areas, you, you may well be able to generate enough here that with solar and batteries, um, it's going to be a, an economically sensible way to deal with, with power and generation. Um, I mean, battery prices have just been cratering. So. Is there anyone else who hasn't spoken yet that wished to speak on this? Okay. If not, Malcolm, you had a quick question. Um, I'll make it the last one. The question, the question is, in case it didn't pick up, uh, he was asking about the kitchen. He didn't notice that was mentioned. There's a small catering kitchen that's adjacent to the community hall. Sure. A um, number of things. Uh, I think council, um, the question was asked about uh, gender uh, neutral restrooms. Uh, there will be um, male and female uh, locker rooms and restrooms. There will also be family rooms, locker rooms that will serve as gender neutral restrooms as well. Um, and so that, that has been uh, thought about uh, and included. Anything else? Okay, thank you everyone.